further computations for us on, on this part. <clears throat> now we face a practical challenge, which is definitely a challenge. And it's very difficult to give you all one and only clear-cut solution. And I'm sorry, but that's just how it is. In a recent, maybe I shouldn't, uh, uh, let, me, let me do it again. Let me see. Ah, I'm not going to do it. Anyway, I didn't plan to do it, so that was a message from somewhere that I shouldn't do something that I didn't plan. Um, and let me stick to the plan. Um, model selection. The practical challenge, which is a challenge out there, that's what I was trying to, to share with you is now when we have this situation where the number of possible X's in the context, now in the wind data, air data, we have three potential X's. We need some kind of approach to, uh, I would say a modeling approach, to say how do we make decisions about which variables should we try, or at least how, what should the process be in investigating all these relations, right? I, I, actually, I sort of started a process already. I started a forward selection process or investigation process, which in a way, as we say, we, that's not really the one we're going to finally su su suggest to you. But it's only fair to mention it to you because the world out there may use either one or a combination. There are no clear-cut final answers here. People disagree, and in some contexts they will do one thing, and in other contexts they will do different things. It's a complexity of the world out there. Now, what we could do, and what I sort of started a little bit, was to start to look at each one individually and maybe pick the one that seems to be the more important because I could check the p-values for the three or the correlations, which would be in one-to-one -one, um, correspondence to the p-values. And then I could, having chosen on, for instance, the temperature as being a apparently the most important thing to uh, predict or model the ozone, I could add the two other ones, one at a time. For instance, first wind and then uh, radiation and see which one seems to be more important, right? Um, and, then, and then we stop when there, we don't need anything more. So we, it's kind of a trial and error approach. Not maybe scientifically completely comforting, but nevertheless, it is. That we put in things that apparently, and then we check the analysis and say, whoa, it's significant. I need it, I'll keep it, right? Or I put in something like the noise variable. I put it in with the temperature, and I say, oh, it's not significant. I throw it away again. I don't need it, right? And in this way, I can build up a meaningful model, hopefully, for what I'm looking at. What we instead recommend as a more safe, but also with some, with some uh, practical challenges, so that's, is what we call the backward approach. In the backward approach, we choose what we consider the full model in the beginning. So in a way, we try to put in everything in this to, to begin with. That is a nice process, that's a nice approach because then we sort of um, at least could believe that we do not start out with something wrong. We at least have everything in, as potentially, in the beginning, right? So we don't, we don't throw away anything in the outset. We have an open mind, so to speak, right? We include the possibility that uh, the ozone could depend on everything. And then we let the analysis tell us what is actually then important, right? Could I throw away something? And I would throw away step by step the least 
important thing, at least if it's non-significant. I shouldn't throw away significant things. Should we try? Let's see. Let's try and see what happens. Did I have this one backwards? Yeah, here I have. Look at this. I even try to add in this noise just for it illustration. It's a bit pedagogical, maybe risky here, because I emphasize this noise exercise is not something you would do in real applications, right? It's just as an illustration, this part of it. I realize the risk here, but nevertheless. Um, It's just to have the nice reassurance that it seems like, look at, I mean, maybe, oh, this is a big thing. First time we do an MLR. Um, look at the results. It's basically the same output. Of course, it's the same function as we used last time. The only difference is this one, right? That now I get all the Bs and I get a hypothesis test, actually for each individual of them, whether they could be assumed to be zero or not, right? By default, that's the hypothesis test being given to us. We'll get back to that formally after the break. Um, the noise, if I use this backward elimination principle, I would look at, are there anyone non-significant, first of all? Yes, there is. So in a way, had there been more than one non-significant term, that can happen very often, I would throw away the one with the highest p-value, right? The one that appears to have the least uh, certain influence. So I would throw away the noise thing here, and following the backward principle, I would make the model Without the noise, I threw that away now, so I have simplified my model. Then I look at the simplified. Do I have anything non-significant in the model now? No. So by this principle, I'm done. At least so far, I'm done. <laughs> um, I cannot throw away temperature, wind, radiation. Are we happy? Let me already now emphasize something important. Let us look, actually, do you remember the value I gave you for the temperature? When I analyze the temperature, versus ozone, only the temperature. You remember? It was 0.07, right? That's, the, that's the how much did uh, the log ozone change with temperature when I only had temperature in the model, right? It was 0.07. Now it has changed dramatically. It's 2 over 7. How many percentages is that? It's a 30% change. 2.7. Right? It's five now. Before it was seven. Two seven. Isn't that around 30%? I would say. It's a 30% change in your conclusion on how temperature, temperature affects lock or zone. This could really piss people off and could uh, get people into a discussion about what is then the real relation between ozone and Temperature. The first analysis, which appeared pretty nice, right? that's what I told you last time, it was 0.07. Now I do another analysis and it tells me it's 0.05 on the same data. What the heck is going on here? The thought about this difference is at the heart of understanding what MLR really is and how it changes the simple linear regression analysis. Which one would you believe if I were to force you? Now, your future is on stake. You have to make a decision. Either, it's the, these are New York data, either you will never be allowed to enter the US 
if you are given the wrong decision, or you will be granted the green card if you make, and it has been the dream of all your life to live and work in the beautiful country, uh, US of A. Um, I've been there a few times. It's definitely a beautiful country, I can assure you. I'm sure many of you have been there. I've studied there for a long time, actually, several times. Really, I can, it can only be recommended. Beautiful country. What's the decision? 0.7 or 0.5? Take it or leave it. What's it going to be? What's it going to be, boy or girl? How many vote for 0.05 that I do now? How many vote for the obvious 0.07? I don't have time to enter a long discussion with you. I would vote for 0.05. But I could also argue in favor of 0.07 if I was forced to do it, right? The point is, these are two different things. And another point is, that we'll get back to at the end, the interpretation in a multiple linear regression is that you have uh, corrected for the other ones. And a, a guy in the economy would in Danish say, alt andet lige. I mean, given the conditions for the other one, keeping the other ones fixed, that's the interpretation. So when I say that temperature, the effect of temperature is 0.05, the, this, the fact is that this is for comparing days with the same wind and the same radiation values. If I compare such days that only differ on the temperature, 0.05 is the correct answer. When I look at the initial plot, when I look at the 0.07 relations, I have mixed in days of varying wind and uh, radiation values. And the problem is that wind and radiation and temperature are also related to each other, right? They don't come independent completely, probably high wind, low radiation. That's just a, a naive guess. Uh, um, so, the interpretation of the MLR is that we correct for the other ones. But clearly that is a more um, parsimonious understanding of the real life phenomenon to allow for this relation, right? So it's a better, but it's also a more complex statement to say, now I compare, I, it, this is a more pure temperature effect, this, um, 0.05, right? Although, having realized this, what could we be worried about now? Having realized that what we tell the world about the relation between ozone and temperature really depends on two other things that we have included in the model because we had the intelligence when we, when we made the plan of this study to record not only temperature but also wind and radiation. What could and should we be worried about them? What about uh, cloudiness? What about yeah, I don't even know and that's the problem, <laughs> right? Well, there could be other things out there that we didn't measure, right? We don't know. There could be uh, unforeseen, there could be underlying uh, things here that really, this, this touch is a very difficult thing also that um, we should be very, very careful about making so-called causal conclusions. And the general rule be, would, would be never do it if you are not very, very sure about <laughs> what you're looking at. It's very dangerous to do, uh, do you know, understand what I mean by causal? One thing is that we observe a relationship and we can, a relationship and we can quantify it, right, by some numbers. And we can also state the significance that yes, definitely there is a relationship. But the same argument could be shown to 
relate the number of starches in Denmark to the number of births, right? Statistical proof of that the starches are coming with the babies. That can be proved by numbers because they follow each other. At least they used to when we had starches in Denmark. Um, so when you do observational data studies like that, there is always a risk that there is an underlying phenomenon that is the reason for both. And that such that you cannot conclude necessarily that it's the temperature that actually physically, whatever, it, that has the causal uh, effect on the ozone concentration. That could then be a discussion about experts in, in uh, environmental researchers and with insights of the real physical and uh, environmental system, biosystem uh, uh, models and relations and structures here, but that's not a stats thing then. I cannot prove as a stats guy, I cannot prove the causality. I can show the relations and then you can discuss the causality. Or we'd have to discuss other studies to prove uh, causality or more complex methods. Okay, a long talk here with the, the, the core thing here. Remember the interpretation of, of uh, the betas in multiple linear regression. They are corrected for the other ones, which makes good sense. I mean, they, that, that's a good thing. It's not a problem. It's a good thing, of course. But it's a different thing than just looking at one thing at a time. It's a better thing, usually, to be able to include everything. Let's do the break now, 15 minutes.